right. I'm going to invite Greg up because Shane needs a proper introduction, but all we have is Greg, so he's going to come up here and do it anyway. I think it'll be okay. <laughs> Can you believe that? Can you believe this? Uh, I uh, uh, first met Shane 12, 13, maybe 14 years ago. I don't have any sense of time anymore, but um, uh, we were on a uh, Faith Matters with Kristen Tippett. Is that her name? Yeah, and uh, um, he and I and Chuck Colson were having a discussion, uh, and it was so fun. I, 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 that was like one of the funnest discussions I've ever been on. It ended up being mainly me and Shane against Chuck. Uh, God bless him, but uh, it was a fun time. At one point, I remember it, it, it was held in a church, as I recall, that's associated with a seminary or something like that. And they had, and this is a big conference, Christian conference thing, and they had some uh, people recruiting for the military there I, I, at some point. Do you remember this? And, and at one point, as you're giving a response, you just stopped and said, and we've got these military people here recruiting soldiers in a church. What's wrong with this? And I thought, I like this guy. <laughs> my, my kind of guy, my kind of guy. But I really got to know him. Uh, what you probably don't know is that we are both failed uh, movie stars. Uh, we had a shot at it. Uh, we were asked to be in this film and played homeless folks. That the film never saw the light of day. But we almost made it, man. We, 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 Shane, we, we almost were there. We had to settle for being preachers and stuff like that. But uh, I, I, I just love this guy. He, uh, you know, we, we, we try to be good citizens. Uh, the Bible tells us to abide by the laws of the land, unless we can't. Uh, in Acts 5, they tell the apostles that you can't preach. Uh, you, there's a new law. You can't preach. And, and their response is, Sorry, no can do. Uh, we have to obey God's law uh, over the words of humans. Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah. And I say that because this dude embodies that. I don't know if you have a life verse, but you should make that one your life verse. Uh, no can do. I, I, got, I got a higher authority that I got to listen to. So would you give a warm Woodland Hills welcome to Shane. Brother, come up here. Be anointed, my man. Be anointed. Stay here a minute. Stay here a minute. Stay here. Um, so, Greg, Greg... Uh, Gave me a Christmas uh, present, which humbly was his book. Um, <laughs> what better present could there be? I, I, I brought you a present. Um, I'm, I, you know, I've read all your books. You know that. We're, bu we're buddies. But um, I figure you might not have a, a, a shirt with the American flag on it. And one of my veteran friends told me that in times of dire distress, you hang the flag upside down and you lament and you grieve. So I got you a, a, a shirt. Sure. And it says distress. And it's got the flag on it. Well, so, that, and in case, so in case anyone's offended, it's got the flag code on the back that says you fly, fly it upside down. Times a dire that, distress. Well, I go, appreciate buddy. that, man. I'll cherish it. That's your Christmas. God bless shirt. you, man. Be anointed. So I am. Um, I'm so glad to be here. I've never been to Woodland Hills, so this is my first time. And uh, uh, I might make a habit of it, but it's a long commute, you know. Um, but I gotta say that uh, it kind of feels like we're singing the same song. Right, and, we're, and, and it's an honor for me to be here during this season where we remember Jesus. We remember Jesus as God showed up. And, uh, you know, one of my neighbors who speaks Spanish as her first language, she says sometimes we make these ideas uh, too complicated, like the incarnation. We talk about that like it's some kind of uh, theology. you got to go to seminary. She said, but in Spanish, when you order your burrito con carne, it means with meat. And she said, so what, God, what Jesus is, is God con carne, with meat on, right? That God puts skin on and moves into the neighborhood. God lives among us. So, but what's also important is how Jesus came. That's what we're going to think about this morning. You know how Jesus came, that, that Jesus came to us. The Savior of the world came to us as a brown-skinned Palestinian Jew from a neighborhood where people said nothing good could come. That's our Savior, right? And sometimes we forget it with all of the, the clutter, you know, sometimes. We, we get distracted by the shopping and, the, and uh, buying stuff. And I remember one pastor told me a beautiful story. He said, I, I got to tell you the story of this Christmas service we had a few years ago. He said, it's one of the most powerful services we ever had. He said, we were all ready for Christmas as usual. Had our sanctuary decorated, the Christmas tree on the altar. We had the wreaths and the red and green and the lights and all the gold. He said, I was praying for the Christmas service. And he said, and that's where it got weird. He said, I felt clear as day. God telling me to take down all the decorations and undecorate the sanctuary. 
And so he said, I'm not one to say no to God. So I said, I'll do it, God, but you're going to have some angry elders. You're going to have to deal with that. And uh, he took down all the decorations. This is right before the Christmas service. He said, and then it got weirder. He said, I felt the Spirit of God telling me to go out to my little farm and bring back some hay and some manure and to redecorate the sanctuary. He said, so I put the hay on the altar and down the aisles. And he said, and it had a little horse poo in it. And he said, it was weird. The next morning, everybody showed up and it was awkward. <laughs> Sitting down there, smelling the poo a little bit. I thought this was Christmas. They got their best dressed clothes on. They're wondering where the lights were. And he said, but then the spirit fell on us. He said, one of the most powerful services we ever had, God spoke as clear as day and said, this whole story is about a God that moves into the poop. A God that gets into the funk of the human condition that leaves all the comfort of heaven to join the struggle here on earth. That Jesus comes to us in the most vulnerable way, in the most unexpected places, that Jesus shows up homeless because there was no room in the inn. Jesus was born in the middle of a genocide. That first Christmas wasn't a celebration for a lot of moms and dads because Herod began slaughtering children all over the land. That's where Jesus showed up, right? So one of my other friends, he's a pastor, he said, yeah, my kids, we started talking about all this. And uh, they, he said, my kids told me they shouldn't get more gifts than Jesus, Jesus at Christmas. So they decided, elementary school kids, we don't want more than three gifts. If we get more than that, we're going to give them away, right? And uh, he said, and one of them was myrrh. I mean, you know, like our kids were praying, they don't get myrrh, you know. And so they, but they said they gave away all the other Christmas presents that season. And they started a little movement called the Advent Conspiracy to take Christmas back for compassion rather than consumption. And so it was beautiful to see these stories of what you're doing here at Woodland Hills to take this season back for compassion, right, rather than consumption. And as we think of Jesus, you know, for me, I, I grew up in a pretty comfortable place. I grew up down in East Tennessee, in case you can't tell, you know, and I grew up in the Bible Belt going to Sunday school. And uh, I, I had really one ambition as a teenager, which was to go figure out how I could make as much money as possible for doing as little work as possible and go snowboarding as much as possible, you know, and then. In the middle, I, and just to tell you how cool I was, I was prom king in my little town. Actually tells you more how little the town was, but you know, that was, I was, I was in a very self-absorbed little world, you know, and then I, I uh, heard a preacher say, if we find ourselves climbing the ladder of success and status and upward mobility, we better be careful or else on our way up, we will make, meet Jesus on his way down. We should be glad that Jesus wasn't too obsessed with his comfort and safety or he may have never left heaven. Because when Jesus came on earth from the moment he was born until he was executed and humiliated on the cross, he was near to the suffering. So one of the questions we ask this year may be, uh, how do we show up? as Jesus' people in the world. You know, there's a lot of people talking about the war on Christmas, and by that they mean uh, we need to make sure we say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays. But I got to say, I, I think God could care less whether we say Happy Holidays or Merry Christmas if we still turn away immigrants and we leave Jesus in the cold this Christmas, right? That, that our Jesus is one who's near to the poor. So I, I, I'm less interested in putting the Christ back in Christmas and putting the Christ back in Christian again, right? That we focus on Jesus this season. And what happened to me is I, I had new eyes to see Jesus as I was in college. I uh, uh, was studying in my classes, but then in the middle of all that, there was an interruption. Uh, my sophomore year in college, there was a group of homeless moms in Philadelphia that had no place to go. It was, a fast, it was and is the fastest growing homeless population. Women and children. The least amount of shelter space. 3,000 families were on the waiting list for affordable housing in Philly. And these moms and, and, and families got together. They started praying and 
They had nowhere to go, so they looked at our city, and we've got abandoned buildings everywhere. We've got over 20,000 abandoned buildings. They said, we've got to find a place. And as they were looking around, they saw church buildings that were abandoned. They said, this isn't just any building. This is the house of God. We should be able to seek sanctuary there. So they moved into it, and they moved into this old Catholic church building on the north side of Philadelphia. Now, sadly, the response of the church was that they were trespassing. Even though it had been abandoned for years, the archdiocese gave them an eviction notice and said, if you're not with it out, within two days, you could be arrested for trespassing on the church's property. Something about that just didn't quite feel right. You know, and there's those moments where you throw your hands up at God and you go, God, why don't you do something? And you feel God say, I did do something. I made you get down there, right? You know, yeah, they, they say when you ask God to move a mountain, God might give you a shovel and say, we're in it together, right? So we went down. And on the front of the cathedral, the families had hung a banner that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore a homeless man on Monday? The families were brilliant. They held a press conference and they said, we mean no disrespect to the church or the archdiocese officials. But we have no place to go. And we talk to your boss. <laughs> the Lord Almighty. And God said we can stay. God said the true religion is caring for the widows and the orphans in their distress. And keeping ourselves from being corrupted by the world. So they stayed. And that was what sparked our little community on the north side of Phil. And we've been leaning in. To those relationships for the last 20 years. We um, have a lot of friends that are still struggling with homelessness and struggling in different ways. And one of the things that we began to see in our city was that uh, Philadelphia began to pass some really terrible laws that specifically targeted folks who were homeless. They, the city passed laws that made it illegal to sleep in public places, illegal to ask for spare change, one of the final laws Philly passed was a feeding ordinance, making it illegal to share food uh, in downtown Philadelphia. And there comes that moment, Brother Greg, right, where we say, we got to obey God, right? And so we said, we're gonna, we want humility, we want the right spirit, but we need to challenge these laws that stand in the way of loving our neighbors. So we decided we'd have a worship service. Uh, we brought our guitars and our drums and we worshiped Jesus. And then we had some pastors that wanted to serve communion, which was tricky, right? Because you, uh, you couldn't feed people. But we said, this ain't food, this is the body and blood. This is a sacrament, right? So we, we uh, shared the food and then, you know, the cops were all around they're like I can't arrest people for having communion you know in fact I need to take communion I think you know and then right after that we kept br breaking the bread by bringing in some pizzas and stuff you know and uh we kept the party going we slept in the park uh and then uh we did that night after night and one night um uh, d d about a hundred of us were there and the police were ordered to arrest us so they surrounded the park they came in they put all of us in handcuffs they took us to jail and we had all kinds of charges and we went to trial and uh, when we went to trial I had a shirt on that said Jesus was homeless and the first thing the judge does he goes come here Jesus was homeless I didn't know that I said, yeah, your honor, in the scripture, Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. That's why it's good to know your scripture, you know. And, uh, and then <laughs> the judge said, you guys might stand a chance. So we, uh, we went to trial and we decided, you know, uh, uh, we needed a spokesperson. And rather than our, our, our big lawyers, we, we wanted someone who had lived the struggle to, to represent us. So our brother, uh, Alfonso, he had uh, lived a lot of his life on the street. And he knew the struggle well. And he agreed. We all knew him as Fonz because he was smooth. We're like, he's going to be perfect, you know. So we, we're praying for him, you know. And uh, there's that scripture that says, when they drag you before the courts, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Spirit's going to give you the word. So we're praying for him. Fonzo stands up and he goes, Your Honor, on behalf of the whole group, I'd like to say, we believe these laws are evil and wrong, and we rest our case. Boom. Right? <laughs> All right. What he said, you know, and then uh, the district attorney was not amused. She was uh, throwing the book at us. She wanted us to go, she wanted us to actually serve jail time and pay thousands of dollars worth of fines. And this was a kicker. She wanted us to have hours and hours of mandatory court sanctioned community service. No, not that. Right. We, we, uh, 
we argue our case. And in the middle of the, the court trial, the, the judge says, listen to me. You don't need to convince me that they were breaking the law. It's very clear to me that they were breaking the law. What's in question is the law. Uh, if, if we hadn't pe had people who break the bad laws, we wouldn't have the freedom we have. That's what this country's built on from the Boston Tea Party to the Civil Rights Movement. Have you heard of the Underground Railroad? He said, we would still have slavery. And then the, the judge said, these guys are not criminals. They're freedom fighters. And I find them all not guilty on every charge. And, um, and, and then he said, and the, and the judge says, how can I get one of those t-shirts? So we, we, we sent him one. We sent him one, right? You should pray that we keep getting that same judge every time, you know. But we, we, those laws recently resurfaced again. Now our city, uh, those laws evolved. And they said, okay, you can feed one or two people, but you can't feed four or five people. Uh, they said uh, it, the ordinance made it illegal to feed more than five people. Crazy, right? So we, we were ready, though. We had our T-shirts that said, if Jesus had done the fish and loaves miracle in Philly, he would have gone to jail. And uh, if you don't get that joke, just talk to me afterwards. We'll work it through. But, uh, you know, we, we were ready. And we testified in public hearings. And this is what was so beautiful. The church rose up. The people of faith talked about our love for Jesus and our love for those who are hurting. My, one of my sisters, was, she's a Pentecostal woman. She stood up and she said, God told me to start making casseroles, homemade casseroles, and taking them down to the boulevard and sharing food with people. She just said, I go every Tuesday. I never miss a Tuesday. For 15 years, I've done it. And God told me to do it. If the mayor wants to stop me, then the mayor better talk to God. You don't, you don't mess with the Pentecostals, right? And then right after, right after her... Uh, 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 another brother, a Catholic theologian, stood up. Incredible brother. He stood up and he, he said, when we feed the homeless, we don't believe we're feeding some pitiful, poor person. We believe it's sacramental that we are feeding Jesus. And to say that we cannot feed the homeless is to say that we cannot feed Jesus. And it's a violation of our religious freedom. It actually went all the way, this is a nice take on a religious freedom, right? It went all the way to a federal court that ruled in our favor saying, to say you cannot feed the homeless is to say that you cannot feed Christ. And it is a violation of our faith, of our religious freedom. It ruled in our favor that we believe this is holy work, right? We believe sharing food with those who are hungry is sharing food with Jesus. It's sacramental. And we believe it as we think about Christmas right now, we can't help but think about our immigrant and refugee brothers and sisters on the border. We think, uh, how can we worship a refugee on Sunday and ignore one on Monday, right? We think that, well, we, we don't need politicians to tell us how to treat foreigners, we can look at the scripture and it says that we are to welcome foreigners as if they were our own flesh and blood. Because we ourselves were once foreigners in Egypt. That when we welcome the stranger, we welcome Christ. If we don't welcome the stranger, we don't welcome Christ. That for us, welcoming immigrants is not a burden. It's a sacrament, right? It's a holy duty. When we show hospitality to the stranger, we might be entertaining angels unawares, right? That this is holy work. And so this, we got to question some of this theology, right, Brother Greg? Like this American. America first is, uh, is a theological heresy. The Bible doesn't say God so loved America. It says God so loved the world. We're to love as big as God loves. <laughs> to be born again means that we have an allegiance bigger than biology, bigger than nationality, right? That, that our love doesn't stop at borders. Our love can't be confined by walls. If someone's suffering on the other side of a wall, it's as tragic as if it were our own flesh and blood. Right? And, and so I, my brothers and sisters along the border, they started these worship services. Um, they actually have a whole network of hospitality houses of Christians who are taking care of immigrant families. They have uh, Christian lawyers that are volunteering their services to help folks try to get through the cumbersome, crazy uh, uh, but bureaucracy to try to become citizens. It's so uh, confusing and unclear. And so they're trying to work with folks. But they also said, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King said that the church is meant neither to be the servant or the master of the state. 
The church is meant to be the conscience of the state. We're to wake people up with love and compassion. We're to love like Jesus. They said, so we need to bear witness right now. This is a moment to shine in the darkness when fear is holding so many hostage. We're to say love casteth out fear. And so they organize these worship services along the border where Christians in Mexico walk to the wall. And they're met by Christians on the U.S. side. They walk to the wall and they worship our Savior. They worship in Spanish and English across the wall. And they said, and one day it got real rowdy. We felt like God wanted us to serve each other communion. So we had to take the bread and throw it up over the wall. And we served each other communion. That looks like Jesus, right? That looks like Jesus. We had a community in Philly that was committed to this love. And they started welcoming uh, immigrant families started welcoming homeless families in their building because they said, we got this building that stays open so much of the time. So we want to, especially in the winter, create a safe place for families. And so, well, you know, our long-term goal is more, you know, uh, uh, hospitality houses and real, you know, dignified housing. But meanwhile, if people have nowhere to go, we're going to take care of them. So they open their building up. Uh, and, and the city, some, some of the government officials came and they said, listen, you can't, uh, we don't know who these people are if they got proper papers and whatnot. We're like, you can't run a shelter. You don't have all the licenses and permits. So we're shutting it down. These guys were Pentecostal too. You'll pick up a common theme here, which is don't mess with the Pentecostals, right? So they said, we're going to pray for a week. We're going to pray about this. And they met back up with those, those officials. And they said, listen, we, we've heard what you said and that we can't run a shelter. So we're not going to think of it as a shelter. You should know that we are a church first and foremost. And what the church does is welcome people, no exceptions. And they said, so we won't call it a shelter. We'll just call it a revival. And we're going to have a revival every night. It's going to start about six o'clock. Our doors are open and it, Lord willing, it's going to go all night long. And uh, we're going to have a revival seven days a week. And uh, they started this revival. It was, all, it was really awesome to watch the news try to track the nuances, right? So they're like, this reporter's outside. They're like, yeah, they said they're no longer, we just talked to the pastor. He said they're no longer running a shelter. They're actually hosting a revival here. Back to you, Tom. You know, and uh, <laughs> like, but we went one night, my buddy and I, and um, had all these families that undoubtedly would be very alone and very fearful if it weren't for the warmth and hospitality of this community. And they shared their stories. We had communion. We worshiped for several hours. And then uh, uh, at about 10 o'clock, and there were many kids there, they said, okay, it's uh, 10 o'clock, so we're going to kind of wind down the formal revival service. The next eight hours or so will still be worship, but it'll be contemplative prayer. So... <laughs> Let's be with God. And it went all night long, right? And as far as I know, that revival's still going. This is a moment for the church to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves, right? That we are the people of God. And so Jesus showed up for us. And now we show up where Jesus showed up. In the places where people say nothing good could come. With those people that have been so shunned and ostracized with the victims of violence as we remember the violence that was everywhere in Jesus' day. I think we can't help but remember the, the violence that is in our world right now, in our own hearts, right? And uh, one of the verses that inspired the early church, uh, the earliest Christians, they, they, they clung to this image of the prophets Micah and Isaiah. Where it says, God's people will beat their swords into plows, their spears into pruning hooks. The passage goes on to say, nation will not rise up against nation. People will learn violence no more. People will live without fear. It's this beautiful image. And uh, in our neighborhood, we still have a lot of violence. In our country, we have a lot of violence. Right? We, we've got 105 uh, lives lost every day to guns in our country. 105, 38,000 lives lost a year. Uh, and just to, we, we, we've, uh, I've been writing a book on guns and, um, and also violence, just the violence in our own hearts. But one of the things I found is that we've got 5% of the world's population in the U.S., but we've got half the world's guns, civilian-owned guns, half the world's guns. We've got more guns than people, over 300 million guns. There are five times more gun shops than McDonald's restaurants. 
So that, that's kind of the world that we're in. And guns are just one evidence of that violence in our hearts, but it's one that is very real to us in our neighborhood. You know, we, I can remember one night hearing the gunshots, and I came outside, and there was a young man that fell on our front steps, and I was holding him, and he was still alive at the time. I'm holding his hand. I'm praying for him. The ambulance came. They took him away. And um, the next day we heard that he had uh, passed on. There comes that moment where Martin Luther King said, we're called to be the good Samaritan and lift our neighbor out of the ditch. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to say, maybe we need to rethink the whole road to Jericho. We need to reimagine the world a little bit, right? And uh, so we, we, that, that season was right before Easter. So we got in the streets and we had worship services in the streets where people had died in the corners where folks had lost their lives. We had one of our most powerful services in front of the gun shop in our neighborhood. And this is not just any gun shop. This is one of those gun shops that has been so irresponsible that they, they've had over 200 guns that have been tracked to violent crimes and murders from that gun shop. So we said, we want to pray for this space, right? But it was Good Friday, the Friday right before Easter. So the young men in my neighborhood, they carried the cross and we put it in front of the gun shop and we worshiped Jesus. And we ended up uh, reading the gospel story of Jesus' violent death, his execution, uh, and the women that wept at the foot of the cross, we read the gospels. But then after the gospel reading, we invited the moms that had lost their kids to tell their own story. And something happened. It was like the tears of our mothers met the tears of those mothers 2,000 years ago, that Calvary met Kensington, and it was that the the passion of Christ met the passion on our streets. And I remember afterwards this woman coming up, uh, she was emotional, she was shaking. She said, I get it, I get it. I said, what? She said, God understands my pain. God knows what it feels like to lose your boy. I realized it was Papito's mom. And I think that's one of the most powerful articulations of the gospel I've ever heard. Better than anything I ever read in my systematic theology books at Princeton. But God understands our pain. That's what we're remembering this season. God understands our pain. Emmanuel, sometimes we sing it as if it was Jesus' middle name, but it means God with us. God is with us. God knows what it feels like. Even, I mean, you want to, something that blows your mind. Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God feels the absence of God. Hang with that for a minute, right? Like, God enters the funk of our world, the struggle with us. That is Christmas. Right, And now as we have been uh, inspired by so many of these families, we, we decided, you know, a part of what we're remembering at Christmas is Jesus showed up for us. But now we are to be the body of Christ to the world. We're to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're to transform this world from what it is to what God wants it to be. And I think for too much of the church, we've just promised people life after death. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm excited about heaven. Like, we're going to party like there's no tomorrow. But Jesus did not just come to prepare. And there won't be a tomorrow. But, you know, like Jesus did, <laughs> did not just come to prepare us to die, but to teach us how to live. The kingdom of God that Jesus talked about is not just something we go up to when we die, but something we bring down on earth as it is in heaven. Let somebody say amen. So we are transforming the world. So we got excited about this beating swords into plowshares thing. And, I, and we... Uh, got some of our blacksmith friends and uh, welders together. And we, th- and we thought, you know, let's just start doing it. And uh, people got enough guns. People got extra. We're not going to make anybody give them. But if they want to, we'll take them. So we say, if you got an extra gun, bring it. You know, like there's all these pastors, uh, Brother Greg, right, talking about bringing your guns to church. We said, we'll have some BYOG Sundays. Bring your own gun. And uh, <laughs> we're going to lay them on the altar, though, because you can't carry a cross in one hand and a gun in the other. Right? We're going we're to transform them. So our first gun we got donated, our first gun we got donated was an AK-47. <laughs> this guy was like, I got one in my closet, and I'm not sure why. You know, so uh, you don't hunt deer with it. I want to get rid of it, and I want to see it be transformed. So this is what it was before, and this is what it is now. Turned it into a shovel and a rake. 
We started getting images from all over the world. Uh, our brother in Mexico that took guns and made them into a guitar. Uh, we we got to get one for the worship team here at Woodland Hills, right? A guitar made out of guns. Our brother in Mozambique made a saxophone out of a semi-automatic. Now, this next picture is, is very special to this Twin Cities region because my friend Sammy Rasuli, who is from Minneapolis, is an Iraqi American. And so he's got roots in Najaf in Iraq. And so he comes back and forth. In fact, the Twin Cities is a, has a sister city partnership with Najaf in Iraq. And, and if you don't know that, I'll tell you how to get involved. But Sammy, he sent me these pictures of guns poured into the streets of Iraq. And they ran over them with a steamroller. And they let the kids drive it. Because they said, the kids are going to lead us into the future. Now, now the last one I... I want to show you, this is a vision. This is what God's doing in the world, right? And so uh, this last one, we found a gun in an abandoned house in North Philadelphia. And we said, instead of just our, our blacksmiths, we want to invite the folks who have been directly impacted, the moms and dads that lost their kids. So we heated this metal up. And I, I'll never forget as this one mother, she began pounding on it. Miss Ryan, she's hitting it with the hammer. And there's a picture of her son on her shirt who was killed in a, a, a random shooting in Philly. So as she's pounding on this metal, she says, this is for my boy. And I got to tell you, it felt like one of those sacramental moments where this is holy work. She's not just transforming metal. She's transforming the world. Right? And this is what we are participating in, right? That day we made a plow, which I, um, I have with me. Not easy to get on airplanes, but we manage. You know, and uh, but this, this, is, this is what we made that day. And now we use it in our garden to uh, for metal that was a part of a weapon that now is a part of a tool that cultivates life. And so this season, as we remember the Prince of Peace, let us remember that it is still a world that is groaning for the good news, for groaning for the kingdom of God. As Romans says, the whole creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. It's like we're pregnant with a new world and they call it labor for a reason that we are to work with God. We're to sweat, to cry, to give birth to a new world. That we are the midwives of the kingdom of God. So thank God that Mary brought us Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. And now Jesus is inviting us to show up. To show up in this world. To stand for love. To stand with refugees. To stand with the homeless. May we do so. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. There's going to be folks that are up here if you want prayer afterwards. My wife and I are going to be back in the back and uh, if you want to say hey. But uh, let's take a moment to pray and just say, oh God, oh God. Thank you for making a perfect world. Forgive us for the, the mess that we've made of it. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to us in a way that we can see and touch and feel and know what love looks like, who God is. Transform us from our self-absorbed narcissism to a, a people who care about the world as you love it, who care about those who are vulnerable as you care about them. Give us vision as the prince of peace. Give us vision of how to live in the way of the cross in a world still plagued by violence. Make us your people and may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May it come in Philadelphia. May it come in Najaf. May it come in Tijuana. May it come in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Let your kingdom come and let us carry it within us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.